So Got good it. afternoon, welcome to the penultimate uh, class in this series. Um, this is week seven, the mission of the church, with one week left after that, the creation of the New Testament. Um, both of these two classes are exciting to me. Um, each week we've learned something. Gosh, I hope we've learned something. Um, I know I've learned a bunch. Um, I've learned all sorts of things, including today you will be with me in paradise. So we've all learned, I hope, something in these last several weeks. Um, but I think there's something very much about the rubber hitting the road in this class, in this session, the mission of the church. Because what our two uh, academics will do in this video presentation is describe in, in wonderful detail and with multiple references to scripture, how the mission of the church really has not changed. Um, it adapts, it, it morphs um, based on the, the context in which it finds itself. But that was true in biblical times also. Uh, the difference between what the church in Jerusalem was doing and experiencing versus what Paul in his missionary journeys was experiencing and doing. For example, both were the church, but both were in slightly different cultural religious contexts. So there's always been adaptation. Don't get me wrong, nothing of this is preserved in aspect. But I think our scholars do a wonderful job of really connecting, um, really tracing the connective tissue between the mission of the church then, then being the apostolic era, and the mission of the church now. And then next week, the final class, um, the, the creation of the New Testament is always something that fascinates me. I know, Herb, you and I have spoken at length about this, and we've even taught uh, about this together. Um, and so that's exciting for me also, and I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I'm anticipating enjoying it. But for this week, um, let me fall silent for once um, as we watch the video, uh, The Mission of the Church. The church has always been a missional community. Wherever Christians have gone, they've taken their faith with them and shared the good news about Jesus with their neighbors. But they not only spoke about it, they lived it out too, in concrete ways. They were self-consciously a kingdom people who believed that their work and effort was really preparing for the kingdom. That is why Christians have always been socially active too. Whether it was ending gladiatorial contests in the fourth century, or fighting for the abolition of slavery in the 18th century, or campaigning to end sex trafficking in the 21st century, Christians have been at the forefront of such work. The reason why the church has always carried out this type of mission is easy to figure out. It's either a direct imitation of Jesus, or else is a direct commission from Jesus. That's where the church gets its mission from. Jesus. When Paul and his companions came to Greece, they didn't always get a warm reception. In fact, they were accused of being rabble rousers, turning the world upside down. How on earth did they get that reputation? What, what were they doing? I think one of the things we in the modern Western world find difficult to realize is the extent to which the ancient pagan religions permeated every aspect of daily life. So that if somebody comes into town and says, actually, these gods don't exist, and there is one true God who does, and you've got to stop oh, worshiping right. these gods and worship the true one, and he's now revealed in and through Jesus, then this doesn't just mean you do something different in your religious slot one hour a week or whatever. It means everything you do is going to be different. You don't take part in the civic processions. You don't take part in the cult, the offering of sacrifices, and so on. And this was how the world worked. And so suddenly, here's this group who aren't doing this. And in the ancient world, civic authorities were often quite worried about any group that started meeting behind closed doors. And we didn't know what they were we're getting up to so that in some cities even the fire brigade if they wanted to have a private meeting people would worry about are they up to some seditious nonsense yeah. and especially yeah, if word leaked out that these people were doing something which involved them 
breaking bread and wine, but they were talking about somebody's body and blood. There were all sorts of rumors that would get out. What are these guys up to behind closed doors? And so there was a sense both that they weren't taking part in all the things that we normally did and that they may be doing things which are deeply subversive. And of course, what the early Christians were doing was worshiping the God we see in Jesus and calling him Lord, which meant that it wasn't just the gods that they weren't worshiping. They weren't giving ultimate allegiance to Caesar. So these little groups that we, in retrospect, call Christians, they were doing things in a different way. They were believing different things. They were acting in a different way in their society. And then, as now, that was perceived as subversive. If we had to summarize the gospel as it's presented in the New Testament, I would put it something like this. The gospel is the royal announcement that Jesus is the Messiah and Lord. And by his death and resurrection, God has won a victory over sin and death. And by faith in Christ and turning away from our sin, we can receive the offer of salvation that God gives us in Jesus Christ. I think we could say that the gospel has five major components. First of all, the gospel is intimated in the Old Testament. That is to say that the gospel is not something that the apostles simply made up out of nothing. When they said that the gospel is according to the scriptures, what they were saying is it's part of the story of Israel. In other words, you can find how the gospel is prefigured and foreshadowed, even prophesied in the Old Testament. Now, you see this in particular in Paul's letters, in places like Romans and Galatians, when Paul's trying to articulate the gospel at theological depth, when he's arguing and debating about it, he'll often go back to the Old Testament to show that it authorizes the specific type of gospel that he's proclaiming. That's why he can quote a passage like Genesis 15, 6, that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. In Galatians, he says, that's where God announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. Or another favorite text of Paul was Habakkuk 2.4, that the righteous will live by faith. So when it came to the gospel, it wasn't new. It wasn't a radical innovation. It was more like what Paul says, that what God has promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, his children, by raising Christ from the dead. A second thing we can say about the gospel is it's part of the kingdom of God. Gospel and kingdom go together. And we can see that, that... In the Garden of Eden, God is already establishing his kingdom, his reign over creation. And even when everything falls or when sin enters, we see God is again giving a promise to Abraham that he will yet reign over the earth. There'll be a one family for Abraham drawn from many people. And then when Israel even goes into exile, Isaiah has a word of prophecy for them, telling them that one day there will be some good news that God is going to become king and deliver them from exile. In the book of Daniel, we have these wonderful insights, these these mysteries revealed to Daniel about the coming of God's reign, and he's going to defeat the evil powers that are oppressing God's people. Jesus himself obviously announced the gospel of the kingdom, not only announcing it, but embodying it. And then in the early church, they believed, but by possessing the spirit, by believing in Christ, they had received a down payment, a deposit of the kingdom of God. And then when you look at the book of Revelation, you can see the kingdoms of the world, the kingdoms of men being eclipsed and the reign of God established finally and fully. That means we've got to understand the gospel as part of this big kingdom story. Thirdly, we can also say the gospel is about the status and story of Jesus. It's about who he is, not just what he does for you, not just what is on offer. The gospel means that Jesus is the Messiah, he is the deliverer, and he is also the Lord. He is the master and commander of the universe, if you like. And that means he must be obeyed. It means he is worthy of our loyalty, our trust, and our devotion. The fourth thing we can say is that what the gospel calls for is faith and repentance. Faith means trust. It means belief. It means assent. 
but it's more than that. It means orientating your life towards someone. It means devotion. It means loyalty. It means an affirmation of who that person is and what they expect of you. And on top of that, there's repentance. Now, at one level, that simply means sorrow for sins, but it also means a complete turning around of your life. It means changing your verdict about your own life, your own worldview, your own religion, and turning towards the Lord of glory. Fifth and finally, we could say that the gospel is about salvation. It's about the good things that God offers us in Christ. And in the New Testament, there's a whole symphony of sounds and images about salvation. It can be described as justification, God declaring us to be in the right, about being reconciled to God, redemption, about cleansing, and all sorts of things. And it's hard to find any single image that can sum it all up. But the good things that God offers us, his blessings, the promise of being with him forever in his new world, that is the offer of the gospel. St. Paul was, of course, a missionary, but what was the heart of his mission? He tells us in a summary form at the end of the first chapter of his first letter to the Thessalonians, written from here in Athens. He summarizes what he said to them. He said, I was exhorting you to turn from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, Jesus, who delivers us from the coming wrath. In other words, it was first and foremost a message about God, and within that, a message about Jesus, and within that, a story about how God was going to bring all things together and how to make sure that one was part of God's people when that happened. But of course, in the ancient pagan world, in Thessalonica, here in Athens, all over the place, the gods were many. They were all over the place. There were temples everywhere. And the good news that Paul brings is that you can forget all that stuff. There is one God, and he made the world. And as Paul said famously in his speech here on the Areopagus, the Almighty does not live in houses made with hands, in temples like these. He is not far from any one of us, because in him we live and we move and we have our being, and he wants us to feel after him and find him. And so at the heart of the mission of Paul is news about God, and so for Paul, all this comes into focus when he talks about Jesus, because it's through Jesus' death and resurrection that people get to see who this God is, because the resurrection says we're in the business of new creation because the God we're talking about is not simply part of the natural order, one of the divine forces that is around somewhere in the world. He is the one who made it all in the first place. So good news about God emerges from the good news about Jesus. And so we can see Paul in his summaries of the gospel when he talks in Romans 1 about the gospel of God concerning his son of the seed of David according to the flesh, marked out as son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus the Messiah, our Lord. Or again, when he does his other summary of the official gospel formula in 1 Corinthians 15, and he says that the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, was buried, and was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And however he summarizes it, this is the message that's coming through. Good news about the fact that there really is one God who made the world and is in the business of remaking it. And as Paul says at the end of his speech on the Areopagus, that he now commands everyone everywhere to turn away from the life that they've been living, this life in which the ancient gods were intertwined with their human life, and to worship and serve the one true God, and to wait for his son from heaven. And so we can see that this message, this gospel, which Paul was announcing in all the different places that he went, is substantially the same message that we find in the gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are what you might call missional documents. They are telling the story of God, 
the God of the world, the God of Israel, encapsulated in the story of Jesus, and they are showing in one scene after another, as well as in the message as a whole, what it means that this God is the true God, and what it might look like to turn away from everything that's getting in the way of your worship of that one true God, and to serve this living and true God instead. It is true, after all, that the God who made the world wants to dwell with people, but not in houses made with stone and marble and timber, but with houses made of human lives, human lives together, human lives as individuals. The gospel is all about the rebuilding of a new kind of temple, the temple which is human beings made to be the place where God will live and move and have his being. I'm sitting here in a first century apartment in the middle of Rome. It's now below street level, but in those days it would have been more or less exactly level with the main street. In subsequent centuries, it was used as a church. And those who are excavating it now, and some of the scholars working on it, think there's a very good chance that this might have been where St. Paul was held under house arrest, possibly with Luke close by, maybe even in another part of the same building. And from here, Paul would have been able to see through the windows onto the street, the Via Lata, the athletes, soldiers, all sorts of processions coming and going, whether celebrating some great victory or possibly on their way to athletic competitions. And if Paul was here, and if it was here that he wrote Second Timothy, then it would make sense for him to have said, I have finished my race, I've fought the good fight, I have kept the faith, I've got the victor's crown already waiting for me. That would be true of an athlete or true of a general. Paul says it's true of him. God has got that crown waiting for him. The righteous judge will give it to me on the last day. And there is, of course, a huge paradox here, which Luke picks up when he's writing Acts. Because at the end of Acts, Luke ends the book with Paul under house arrest, quite possibly right here. And he's there for two whole years. Luke doesn't tell us what happened next, but strong tradition is that Paul was put to death here in Rome. And somehow, as Luke is writing his book, The Acts of the Apostles, he wants to say two things which to us clash quite sharply. On the one hand, yes, the way the gospel advances is through the suffering of God's people, through their being rejected, through their saying and doing things which make people not only laugh at them, but want to put them in prison and even kill them. But Luke ends the book by saying that Paul was here, and throughout those two years, he was teaching people about the kingdom of God and announcing the lordship of Jesus Christ openly and unhindered. That's the paradox. That's how the gospel goes out. As Paul says, remember my gospel about Jesus the Messiah, risen from the dead, descended from David. And he says, it's because of this gospel that I am wearing this chain. And then he says, but the word of God is not chained up. And that's the message both of Paul and of Luke at the end of Acts, that though Paul is here apparently in human terms with nothing to hope for, there is everything to hope for, because God is God, because Jesus is Lord, and because the word of God is not chained. As the early church undertook their mission, they weren't just concerned with theological ideas and abstract propositions, but they were deeply concerned about the welfare and well-being of people amongst their ranks and indeed around the wider city. And that's why we find a, a, a big emphasis on mercy, charity, compassion, and can caring for the vulnerable. Now, this goes back, of course, to Jesus' very own ministry, where he was very concerned for the poor, very concerned for their estate. And that's why he spent so much time with them, praying with them, healing them, proclaiming the good news to them. And that carried on into the early church. In fact, there's one glorious scene in Galatians 2, where the apostles are jostling about the gospel that will be proclaimed to the Gentiles. And the pillar apostles in Jerusalem, that's James, John, and Peter, they ask Paul to remember the poor as he goes proclaiming the gospel. And Paul says, this is the very thing I was eager to do. 
And that is why when Paul traveled around, he would take up a collection for the poor. And we find similar exhortations throughout the New Testament. To give an example from the letter of James, there's one particular part where James says, there's no point in allowing people to come into your midst if they're, they're poor and if they're hungry and they don't have much clothing. And you simply say to them, well, I hope it all turns out well. Hope you find some food and some clothes and some someplace warm to go. There's no point saying that if you have faith, you should actually be actively helping them. And by and large, that's what the church tried to do for their own people and even for the vulnerable around them. And this is why we could say that two of the distinguishing marks of the early church was their care for the poor, the vulnerable, the widows and the orphans. And this is why they would often do things like take up a collection for the poor or else they would try to help the sick by praying with them and getting them type of care that they needed. Now, if we try to translate this into our own context, we could say that's the type of thing we should be doing in our own churches as well. We should be trying to imitate Jesus in what he does. We should be loving God and loving our neighbor, even our sick neighbor. We should be trying to find ways in which we can, we can pray for the sick and the affirm, make sure they can access affordable health care and do whatever we can, not just to give people a hand out, but a hand up out of poverty. That is how we continue the mission of the church in our own day. Some of the greatest promises in the Hebrew scriptures, Paul's Bible, which we call the Old Testament, concern the renewal of the whole creation. Isaiah speaks of the earth being full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And the prophet Habakkuk speaks of the earth being full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And I often think, what does it mean as the waters cover the sea? The waters are the sea. And somehow what seems to be being said is that God intends to flood the whole creation with his presence and his glory. And right at the end of our Bible, the book of Revelation, we find the new Jerusalem coming down and so that heaven and earth are joined together at last. And that picture is sustained in several other bits of the New Testament, like Romans 8, where Paul talks about the whole creation presently groaning like a woman in labor, but one day creation being set free from its slavery to decay to inherit the freedom that comes when God's children are glorified. How is that going to happen? Well, according to the New Testament, it happens through the power unleashed in the resurrection of Jesus, and then in the power which goes on working through what we call the Holy Spirit, who is active in people's lives and hearts, but in many other ways all around the world. And somehow the Christian mission and evangelism holds together the picture of what God has begun in the resurrection with that new creation, and what God will do one day transforming the world, throwing away death once and for all, and suffusing this whole creation with his presence and his love and his power and his glory. And here's the thing about Christian mission. Christian mission is held in place by these two things, so that when we go and tell somebody that Jesus is Lord, that God is God, we're not simply trying to persuade them to have a new religious experience. And when Christians talk about Jesus and about his saving death and resurrection, they're not simply saying, here's somebody who can help you out of the present mess and maybe help you away from this earth altogether to another place called heaven. What they are doing is planting signs of new creation within the world as it is, so that in the power of the resurrection and in the fresh wind of the spirit, God will be at work to transform people's lives and people's societies. So that what we're doing in Christian mission, as we work for justice and beauty, as well as proclaiming the gospel, is producing signs of new creation. Because if the gospel is all about God doing new creation through Jesus and through the Spirit, it makes no sense to do that, to say that, unless we are working for those signs of the kingdom in the present as well. We are building for the kingdom. We are not building the kingdom by our own efforts as though we could just do it all with God just watching. No, we are building for the kingdom. As Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, what you do in the present, in the power of the Spirit, is not wasted. That is part of the truth of resurrection, that everything we do in the name of Jesus and the power of the Spirit, all works of justice and mercy, all works of beauty and delight, 
these will somehow be taken up, transformed in the new world that God will one day make. We've been talking a lot about the mission of the ancient church, but what about our mission? When I face this, I always start off by thinking about what Paul said when he was speaking on the Areopagus, that on the one hand, he was saying, you have this altar to the unknown God, and let me tell you who this unknown God is. And it seems to me in contemporary culture, there are lots of places which are like altars to the unknown God, places where people are reaching out beyond themselves, where they know that they come to the end of their resources and they say, there must be something beyond, we're just not sure what it is. And for some people that may be great ancient buildings, for some people it may be music, for some people it might be falling in love. Now, any of these can go horribly wrong on you, but they can be places where we can say, actually, there is a larger story which makes sense of this, and if you are prepared in humility to work with that larger story, you can go somewhere with that, towards the true God. But the other thing Paul did on the Areopagus was that he pointed out the folly of worshipping idols, that uh, uh, the, the real God does not live in houses made with hands, that's not the sort of being he is at all. And the trouble is every culture generates its own idols, and perhaps in the modern Western world we would say that obviously Mammon, the god of money, Aphrodite, the god of sex, and perhaps Mars, the god of war, and many other idols which we kind of worship unthinkingly so that if these forces as we call them tell you that you have to do this or you have to do that then we say okay i have to do this um, and instead it seems to me one of the tasks of the church as it was in the ancient world is to learn to worship the true god instead of those idols so that instead of simply saying that whatever war demands we've got to do it we ought to be working at that beatitude which says blessed are the peacemakers and instead of saying whatever sexual energy demands, you've got to do it, we ought to be working at saying, how do we actually create and sustain healthy, wise, long-lasting marriages? And, and, and so on with money. Instead of saying, we just have to make more and more money for ourselves, and that's the ultimate imperative, that's the worship of mammon, we have to say, actually, in the Psalms, in the Gospels, in Paul's writings, right through, we have to say, how do we take care of the poorest of the poor? And how do we share generously whatever God has given us. And these are ways in which you can actually worship the creator God on territory currently occupied by today's idols. And it's easy, that's doing pretty much the same kind of task that Paul was doing when he summoned people to worship the God we see in Jesus instead of the idols that were all around him in a city like Athens. And if we were to do that sort of thing, we would definitely be turning the world upside down. Uh, yeah, we would be turning the world upside down because People just go unthinkingly with whatever, as we say, forces are out there in the We call them forces. The ancient world called them gods and goddesses. Um, but if you actually try and live in a different way, not only are you turning the world upside down, you run into trouble. People don't like it. Uh, you're suggesting there might be a different way to be human. And the answer from the very beginning of Christ the Christian faith has always been, yes, there is a different way to be human. Jesus not only modeled it, but died and rose again to make it a reality, and we're called to follow that. I, I am constantly in awe of how much those two gentlemen can squeeze in to a 30-minute video presentation. Uh, I've been awfully aware that in the last several weeks, I've launched into what I wanted to say. And then in the last 10 minutes, um, I, I've remembered to ask you what you wanted to talk about. So I'd like to reverse that this week because there's so much that I agree with there, but I want to see what you heard, uh, what you reflected on, whether you agreed and let's start to tease out some of the implications of what we heard. So I'm going to throw it open to you to you all. Um, where would you like to begin? What what was it that either particularly appealed to you, particularly annoyed you? What is it you'd like to, to us to talk a little more about? Um, what would you like us to focus on? And I'm going to stop and give someone a chance to shout something out. <clears throat> okay, I'll start. Uh, Thank you, Steve. The, the thing that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the, the, the thing that I keep thinking about as I listen to all of this is 
actually not in this study and it is how did we get from there to here mm -hmm. and perhaps you and pastor herb can help us understand you know the life of the church because it seems to me that there's a whole bunch of gaps in there and and i just it, it was a small group compared to the larger population mm -hmm. how did it survive and how did it thrive and when did it survive and when did it thrive i guess it's a real well, question. I, I, it's fascinating there, there was a fairly recently published book um well the short answer to that has always been something miraculous the church has always ex uh, uh, interpreted its exponential growth as being a sign that god was god was present and that the Holy Spirit was driving this change. Um, some scholars relatively recently um, undertook a, a lengthy study trying to figure out how much, uh, how to explain why small movements become enormous movements. And, and of course, as you would uh, anticipate from scholars, their answer was, no, no, that's what happens when things just catch fire, when an idea takes off. That exponential growth is something that you can anticipate. Um, but what happened seems to be that because of Paul, um, because of trade routes, uh, because of centers of learning, and then the the, the movement of, of uh, scholars and disciples, you have instead of a big flame starting at point A and going whoosh, you have that kindling flame, say in Jerusalem, to carry on from uh, Luke, uh, and especially Luke Acts, starting in Jerusalem. But it doesn't spread like that. That flame is taken from there to a multiplicity of points, geographical po points around what's known as the known world, so that around the Mediterranean, um, amongst the Jewish diaspora, um, but also amongst Gentiles that were just Roman citizens or part of that Greco-Roman culture. And it, and it, and it takes off in, in, in small house churches, in small communities, and just gradually grows and grows. But then you reach a point in and Herb might be able to help me. Um, was it 332, um, the Edict of Milan, um, where where Constantine, who is the emperor um, of Rome, uh, legalizes Christianity. And at the moment that uh, uh, people often misspeak and say that Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. He did no such thing. He simply legalized Christianity and thereby made it socially acceptable. His mother having become a Christian before he did. Um, I'm sorry, 313. 313, thank you. Um, now, now there, there's miraculous ways to describe that. The, the Battle of Milvan Bridge, um, Constantine saw an image in the sky uh, of the, the Cairo the, the P and the R, um, the P and the X, I should say, and, and a voice from heaven said, by this sign you shall conquer. And Constantine made that symbol, the Cairo symbol, uh, the symbol of, the, of, of his soldiers, and they, and, they, uh, and they won the battle of Milvan Bridge. And so that was his nudge towards Christianity. But once Christianity is legalized, then off it takes. Um, and it requires a good sociologist uh, every bit as much as it requires a good theologian to explain why. But but take off it does. Um, you know, maybe maybe the best example to give, something that, that really relates to us, um, think of the Protestant work ethic. And the Protestant work ethic is is something that's used to explain the 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 growth of capitalism in Northern Europe and in um, in in North America, um, the Protestant work ethic that that drives one on to success, that 
starts to value individual freedoms and property rights, the Protestant work ethic is just a perfect breeding ground for capitalism, for, for democracy and capitalism. If you have a good idea in the right place at the right time, if that soil that it's planted in is good, it goes whoosh. Um, so Christianity, I wonder what so sociologists differ about this, but what is it about the Christian ethos that when you allow it to be free in Greco-Roman culture, which Constantine most certainly did, what is it that just makes that go, yes, that's, that's the fertile ground. There's something about the Christian mindset, the Christian way of living, the Christian way of interacting with power. Um, there's something that just makes it ideal uh, in the Greco-Roman world at just the right time. Does that make sense, or was that as meandering as it felt? It, it, it certainly helps. Yeah. Good. I'll settle for that. Uh, Low-hanging fruit is good. I'm going but, to say that understanding, understanding Christianity becomes a lot easier when you have traveled in the ancient Greco-Roman world and when you realize how much that culture contributed toward the spreading of the message. It was not only by sea. Remember that the Romans were known for the roads that they constructed all over the place. And we have people who are moving. And when you're visiting in the Greco-Roman world, some of the ancient sites that are still there today, Ephesus, Corinth, uh, Thessalonica, and others, you begin to be overwhelmed by the number of by the number of uh, statutes and, and, and uh, memorializations to ancient gods. Yeah. And you realize how this must have overburdened people. Yeah. You know, having so many things in which to believe, here is finally an answer that's beginning at least to make some sense, even though in a paradoxical sense. Very good point. The, the other thing that ties in with that is that the other religions are somewhat settled in their teaching and their theology and, and the structure of their belief system. So by the time Christianity comes along, um, as, as the, our scholar said a few weeks ago, the Greek gods have been incorporated lock, stock and barrel into Roman mythology just with the change of names and some tweaks here and there um, in the story, but absolutely either identical or recognizable. Judaism has had several thousand years by this point to, to have its uh, belief system fully fleshed out. Um, although there is a, a, a lot of scholarship that points out that rabbinical Ju uh, Judaism, which is what we see of Judaism now, um, rabbinical Judaism is almost exactly as old as Christianity. And so the version of Judaism we have now isn't any older in, in, in its form than our religion is. But ancient Judaism certainly goes back further. So what I'm getting at is that's all established. Now you've got the new guy in town. And it's a new faith that's largely in a, in a, a mode of discerning. So uh, remember a few weeks ago and, and forever thereafter, um, I've been talking about Paul reverse engineering Christianity because he starts with a resurrected Jesus and works backwards. Um, I mean, he has to. Uh, that, that's not a criticism. It's an observation. Well, the whole of the Christian faith is doing the same thing uh, at the same time as Paul and then when the apostles all die off, when you move into the patris patristic period, period of the church fathers, they're doing the same thing. They're trying to discern meaning out of a series of events. And they're trying to develop a teaching out of what they've only just learned. That means that Christianity, as it starts to grow, there's parts of Christianity that we would not recognize now as being Christian, except that Jesus' name is in there. Because we haven't at that point yet had a definitive, enforceable set of beliefs. 
because the definitive enforceable set of beliefs, if you would care to just Google the next bit, um, doesn't happen until the Council of Nicaea. And, and there, you won't get a firm date for the Council of Nicaea because the Council of Nicaea was actually a series of councils that met in Nicaea and Constantinople. So it's actually the Nicaean Constantinopolitan Creed. Uh, you can see why we just call it the Nicene Creed. That's too much of a mouthful. But what that, what that uh, series of, of, of church councils did, bringing together all of the Christian leaders of pretty much the known world, under the auspices of the emperor of Emperor Constantine, um, they decided uh, who Jesus was. So it's often said of the creeds, doesn't actually say much about what Jesus did, which is strange because we are a people based on precisely that. What did Jesus do? And whatever Jesus did, that's what we're meant to do as well. And if you ever read the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, there's almost diddly squat about what Jesus does. It's all about who Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit are. And that's deliberate because that's what the council was formed to decide. And as soon as the council of Nicaea said, this is right belief, everything else that wasn't right belief was revealed to be wrong belief. I mean, if we're in the backyard making up the rules of baseball, we're happy as a kid in a sandbox. Um, but when someone comes and says, oh, by the way, there is actually there are actually rules to this game, and, and one of these days, you'll have to teach a Scotsman what the infield fly ball rule is and be very patient because he's not going to get it for about 15 years. Once someone says, oh, no, there's actually rules to baseball. Well, now we know that if Alan and I are disagreeing on how to play it, now I know that Alan's wrong because we've got the set of rules. And, uh, you know, whatever he's playing, it might be wonderful, but we've now discovered it's not baseball. So the same thing happens to Christianity. So a big explanation of how it catches on is that there is a wide swathe of beliefs of who Jesus is and what he did and why he was here. And we can look back on it now, and Herb and I could probably develop a drinking game of, you know, name, name that heresy, you know. And, uh, and every time we discover that heresy, we can, we can raise a glass of scotch and take a mouthful because, because we know what those heresies are. But at the time, they weren't heresies. They were just other ways of being church. So, so you've, got a, you've got everything I said before about the growth of Christianity. You've got everything Herb said before about the growth of Christianity. Now imagine that you've got lots of elbow room. You're painting with, with, with you know, very little frame around it. Um, and boy, it catches on um, until that very painful period comes when you've got to try and put the toothpaste back in the, in the tube. Because now after the Council of Nicaea and subsequent councils after that, you have the church together trying to decide what truth is. And in doing so, whether it intends to or not, and most times it didn't tend to, you've instantly declared what's heresy and what's wrong. And some of those heretical communities heretical communities take a while to get brought back in line with what the church now has declared to be the faith. But hey, the hard work's been done. There's some painful work still to do, but a lot of the hard work's been done because now you're not introducing a new religion, you're just trying to correct the errors of a religion that already exists. Oof. I'd like to make a further observation. Yes, please, sir. Here at Westminster, we have... Uh, over the course of, well, I guess the last six weeks, been watching a television series that is known as Choices or Chosen, Chosen, oh, yes. C H O S E N. Yes. Uh, it is fictional in nature, but it is based basically upon the life of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has come across in that depiction is the importance that Jesus attributed to women and the role of women in the early church. And we see that certainly in, in many of Paul's letters, uh, who were some of the main stalwarts in the church, but women. Yeah. And women have an opportunity sometimes more than males do to be able to communicate with one another, to share with one another their thoughts, their feelings, even the depth of their thinking. Yes, 
I, I thought the same thing, even just watching the other night, I happened to be watching the episode about the uh, the wedding at Cana. Yes. And just yes. seeing and seeing the uh, Mary at work, seeing the mother of the bride at work, seeing Mary Magdalene sitting there at the table with this, at that point, small group of disciples and saying, and they're all holding their own. There's no tokenism there. They're all central to Jesus' life and ministry and witness. Even the Church of Rome is starting to come around a little. Pope Francis is making all sorts of noises about saying, well, of course, we're only it's only a matter of time before we'll have women deacons. Um, women priests, I think John Paul slammed the door in. He almost made an ex cathedra uh, statement about that, almost, a, almost invoking papal infallibility over women not being priests. But uh, at least Francis is nudging us towards women deacons in Rome. Um, I, I recommend that series to you. I mean, just read the caption of the stuff. Have you guys been watching? Isn't it great? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because because what they've done for those who are not, they, they, they're, ta they're taking the, the story of the gospel, but placing it in some sort of relational context. So on Sunday, was it last Sunday or next Sunday? I'm always working several weeks in either direction. We have the calling of Matthew in the tool booth. And it says, uh, uh, Matthew, follow me. And Matthew followed him. And at, at every time I read that now, I think to the whole backstory they provided about Matthew. And it's like, yeah, see, that makes sense. Follow me. Well, duh, okay. And off you go. Yeah. Some automaton, you know, some unthinking schmuck who's, who's now joining Jesus. And all these people had backstories. And, and sometimes you, they've got to make educated guesses, which I think is what they're doing. And I believe that's what they're doing in The Chosen. They're not just making stuff up, um, but they're trying to make educated cultural context guesses. I think it's magnificent. Yeah. However, I'm not so sure that I would recommend it for Sunday school children learning about Jesus for the first time. No, you're, you're absolutely right. What I think it requires is people to know the story and be able to watch watch an episode and say, I I can I know what part of that was scriptural. And now I think that's a splendid imaginative exploration of what might be um uh, extra canonical beyond beyond the canon. Yeah, you're right. I would I would use it in an adult class. I would never um I don't know. I I, I might use it with a confirmation class with a whole lot of talking before and after about putting the context or or having the kids read ahead of time the, the, the biblical text and then watching the show. Sitting yeah. in an institution such as I am in, uh, there are never ending amazement over the fact of how few people over the age of 80 really know what the biblical message is all about. It's all new to some of them. Hmm. Some have never heard the message of salvation. Yeah, I hear you, Louise. One of my favorite hymns. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So, uh, what else in in this episode did uh, jumped out at you? I mean, I know what jumped out at me, but I'd like to hear what jumped out at you. Well, I always. Hold on. I'm sorry. I'm going to teetotal. I always like when you um, dismiss at the end of a service, go in peace, remember the poor. And, and I appreciate having been a member of congregations where there are uh, efforts like the quilting group, like the refugee ministry, um, or when we were in Houston, um, the homeless ministry that we had. But what I noticed here, you know, it's what they chose to film was the man that was sitting there with the green cup, not one person, Mm. Through through a shekel in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, the the I thought they covered. I thought they covered um, in in good biblical terms, uh, the importance of of Jesus' ministry to the poor. Uh, I know that these, but no, it's not these days. That was a silly thing to even start to say, Kenneth. Um, I always know I'm in trouble when I call myself Kenneth because I was always in trouble when my mother called me Kenneth. <laughs> I was in even bigger trouble if she called me Kenneth Charles. 
Um, I know that these days, and perhaps twas ever thus, you start to slip into politics and differences of opinion about how to interact and serve the poor. Which is why I quite like the fact that they'd said, figure a way of giving someone a hand up, not a hand out, um, and, uh, and pointing out that we're serving the most destitute. Um, and I, so I know that it starts to impinge upon politics and public policy. And the church is never very good when it's on that ground. Um, but you simply cannot escape the Old and New Testament emphasis on helping the vulnerable. Um, and I would hope that we could, as a church, have a healthy disagreement about how we help, uh, but not that we'd have any disagreement on the fact that we should help. Um, and, you know, I, I was taught um, by street ministers um, about what not to do with uh, to help the homeless, about what I thought was helping them, and a street minister telling me, that's 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 only making you feel better, Ken. That's 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 not doing anything to help them. Um, you know, in fact, you're helping them, maybe hurting them, and probably is. Often, there's no maybe about it. Um, and to be able to hear that from someone whose entire ministry is uh, walking the streets of downtown um, at night and talking to the homeless, serving the homeless in all the woods, you know, in Sarasota County. Um, who has no political act to grind, but just simply to say, Ken, stop helping because you're really not helping. You know, So I would hope we could have a very healthy disagreement on how we help, but that we would never reach a point as the church where we decided not to help. Um, because I think it's so, so much part of our DNA. Um, at the very least, out of imitation of Christ, the very least out of listening to the, the the words of the prophets, which are written on the subway wall. Sorry, I had to get my Simon and Garfunkel in there somewhere. You would have all been disappointed if I hadn't. Um, but but you know we've got it in our heads that the that the prophets of old, it was entirely about uh, worshiping idols and sexual immorality. But actually, nine times out of ten, when you read the prophets, what they're castigating. Um, Israel for, or the people of God for, is that the way that they don't treat, uh, the, the way they've turned away from the, the poor and the oppressed and the outcast, um, and, and where, where that family relationship that's meant to embody the people of Israel has broken down, and we've all simply gone our own ways. And, uh, you know, as one prophet says, you, you can't, you know, you're even, you're even um, cheating the poor by having uh, unjust weights and measures, uh, you know, I would hope that at least at that point we, we, we could say that helping each other and care for the, the vulnerable is part of the DNA of Christianity. It is not, I need more air quotes, it is not social gospel. It's simply gospel. It's simply imitation of Christ. But lest I be misunderstood, I say again, um, we can most certainly, because the church has historically not always been in one mind about how to help. But, but has been in one mind that that it must help. And the bit about uh, affordable health care, I don't think that's a particularly North American dig. Um, one of the professors is Australian and the other one is British, and so they probably barely know or understand American health care. That wasn't meant to be a political dig. They're simply reflecting the two nations they come from, in which more air quotes, socialized medicine is, is, you know, has been the order of the day since World War II. Um, thoughts about that? Thoughts about, about how we help the poor, the oppressed? The, do, I mean, do we agree it's part of our DNA? Yes. As an imitation of Christ. Um, yes, I, I agree with that completely. Um, I sometimes have trouble understanding how we determine who the poor are that we're going to help. It's true. That's, that's you, good. I mean, yeah. we, we, we have a country, we can't help the world. We can't feed the world. So how do we decide what is a godly, uh, a godlike action helping those that need it 
and recognizing the fact that there are limits to everything. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a that's that very troubling what's happening right now because uh, you know we're we're housing, we're feeding, we're putting them up in hotel rooms and giving them phones. Anybody who can make it across the border, and frankly, as a Christian, I can't afford that. As a country, I don't think we can afford that. Uh, if you realistically think about the debt that goes with being generous like that, how do we how do we control that? I, yeah, I, I hear you. Um, I'm I'm always I, I'm always I always try and focus on um, kind of what I uh, said before, which is um, figuring knowing that we have to do something and figuring out what the best and most effective thing we can do is, while acknowledging even that's going to be be uh, prone to disagreement. And, and I think anyone that tells anyone else that they have a monopoly on understanding what that is. Um, is either self-deluded or or they're selling you a shoddy bill of goods because I don't think any of us have a have a monopoly on the knowledge of what is best for people. Um, mm -hmm. What uh, you know, what at what point is uh, at what point are we? Are, are, like I said earlier, at what point are we fooling ourselves into thinking that we're helping when actually all we're doing is, hurt, is hurting? I mean, not just that we're not helping, and so it's a waste of time and energy, but that sometimes our help is actually a hindrance, and sometimes our blessing is actually a curse. Um, and it's very difficult to have that conversation because um, on both sides of the political spectrum, we get all hot under the collar uh, because we think we have a sort of a unique, a unique knowledge and we've got it down pat. Um, sometimes it's, it's better to, to start where you kind of did, Doug, which is saying, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but I know it isn't this. <laughs> you know, at, at least we can say, you know, let, let's. Uh, and if we reach that point and say, none of us really know what the what the absolute ideal answer is. Let's let's work on it together. Um, I've seen that work in communities. Um, you know, I, I would be I would be remiss if I didn't sort of quote. I'd love to find out if this is true. Um, that, that some of the countries of the world have such a high defense budget that if you just devoted three weeks of the defense budget, you could accomplish. And there's always a meme that says, you know, you could you could end world hunger if you didn't do this and didn't do that. But I, I think the 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 wealthy countries of the world, I, I would suspect, um, have the resources to do all sorts of things. Um, but we can't do everything, so we choose what to do. And sometimes when we choose what to do, we've, um, and when we choose explicitly what to do, we've implicitly decided what we're not going to do. And a lot of it is a sense of priority. Um, there's a person in this congregation that I'm sure wouldn't mind me telling this story. I'm not going to give you his name. Um, I married his daughter uh, a few years ago. Sorry, I must stop saying that. I presided at his daughter's wedding a few years ago. And uh, he said, you know, I love my daughter, and I was looking at the cost of the wedding going up and up and up and up, and finally it dawned on me. Um, he said, I sat her down and I gave her a budget. And I said, you know, if you really want to spend 10 times more than I do on the band, you can do it. And then you can decide what you're not going to, you know, what you're not going to spend that money on. Incidentally, by the end of the night, it was the most expensive band that anyone on Captiva had ever remembered having, and it was a great band. And my friend said, I don't care what that band cost, it was worth it. <laughs> um, <laughs> because everyone was dancing all night. It was ridiculous, well, except for me, I was watching. I, I don't dance. If you ever saw me try, you'd understand why. Um, Sorry. Okay. Now it, I'm now I'm meandering, becomes, but but uh, and so I'm going to try and stop before I leave the county. I was going to say it becomes a challenge, however, on a Sunday morning, to leave the sanctuary at St. Armand's Key, cross the Ringling Bridge, and get to the east side of the Ringling Bridge, and be encountered by someone who is holding a piece of cardboard that says "homeless, need work, hungry." And he's holding his hand out. Mm. Yeah, it, it's that close to home. Yeah, and and that's you know you can you can see that in the New Testament and Old Testament, 
um, given the number of beggars. I mean, beggars have always been around. Um, Jesus' solution was uh, give to anyone who begs from you. Um, I must confess, I don't follow that. Um, and, and, but, but when I don't follow it, I know I'm disregarding the words of my Lord um, because he said, give to everyone who begs from you. And if someone asks for your shirt, give them your jacket as well. And, um, you know, that's, those are very powerful words of our Savior. But I don't. I, I don't do it always. But I, I've said before, I, 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 there's people in this congregation who will never give money uh, at an intersection, but on the back uh, seat well of their car, um, and there's probably a name for that, behind the passenger in the driver's seat in the footwell of the passenger of the back seat, they've got bags um, that have things like, you know, maybe two or three bottles of water in each bag and a couple of nutrition bars. Um, and someone, I, I, there was someone else threw something in that at the time I thought was very creative. And now, of course, because I have a mind like a sieve, I can't remember what it is. But the point is they put together a little kit and whenever they got to an intersection, they would say, um, here's some refreshment. And if the person was just looking for money or trying to con, it's like, yeah, what am I going to do with that? But they said it's remarkable the number of times people opened it. And all that was in there was a couple of nutrition bars and two, you know, cheap Sam's Club bottles of water. And they were ecstatic. It's like, geez, thank you. I mean, not geez, thank you, but really Oh, wow, thanks. That, that's great. Um, so that person, or the people that I've just described, had figured a way to always give to beggars, but they would never give money, not even 50 cents to the beggar, because they didn't want that 50 cents to go with a dollar, another two dollars, and they were just round, um, you know, standing next to me in the liquor store. Uh, and, but, but still, they had given... They'd given a cup of cold water to someone who was thirsty. How biblical is that? And uh, and I know they're telling the truth because one day I tried to climb in the back of their car and it was just packed with plastic bags that they would just reach behind and and give out to people. So there's an example of of you know how do we how do we serve someone without leading them astray? How, how do we give generously to someone and yet know that that's not going to end up being parlayed into a you know, a, a bottle of liquor uh, at five o'clock or 10 o'clock. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And, you know, <clears throat> once we start to get creative like that, it's st giving starts to get exciting, you know, um, where you say, you know, I will not be taken for a fool. I, I, am, I am one of the clowns of God, but I'm not, I'm not going to be taken for a fool. But I can show my love to someone in that way that's not going to harm them, not going to hurt them, will actually assist them. And, in, and whatever I do for them is going to be to their benefit and not, you know, not to their detriment. Anything else? What else do, What else jumps out at us? So one of the things in a negative sense that jumped out to me is in this whole chapter about the mission and the message of the church, they never talked about grace. And I thought, these guys aren't Lutheran. <laughs> Interesting. They're, they're, I don't know what Bird is, but no, um, N.T. Wright is a former Bishop of Durham, uh, the third third or fourth most senior bishop in the Church of England. Um, no, no. Uh, so what? Uh, although he did write a very powerful book called Surprise by Grace. Surprise by Hope. By Hope. Oh, that's right. I'm thinking of C.S. Lewis. Have you seen the one that was Surprised by Grace? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but what they talked a lot about which was the equivalent of it, were the multiplicity of blessings received from God uh, through the Holy Spirit. That was, that was um, and I'll look to Herb to, to find out if, if he thinks I'm dancing on the head of a theological pin there. But I think grace was present, but without the word being used. Um, which also is, is surprising because N.T. Wright is one of the world's foremost living scholars of Paul. And Paul is filled with God's grace. I mean, that's that's the same criticism of, of Luther, Paul, and St. Augustine, or St. Augustine, um, that they were over-reliant on grace and were thereby anti-nominalists, nominal, nominal, anti that they were against the law. 
uh, because grace was emphasized so much. But you're right, Steve, it wasn't it wasn't said explicitly. <laughs> I think it was present implicitly. Herb? N.T. Wright is being uh, pictured by many people today as more a church historian than he is a theologian. Mm. Yeah, which is the which is the position he held at St Andrews um, until his retirement the other year. Um, a professor of early church, professor of early was it early church history or how did they describe it? Hold on, I can just read it. Um, is chair of New Testament and early Christianity at the School of Divinity, University of St Andrews. Um, yes, but but his biggest claim to fame is having finished that multi-volume buy it if you want a, a very attractive doorstop um, series of books on Paul. Uh, he, he is he's very much a Pauline scholar. But I think grace is present there. I think, um, uh, I, I, yes. But interesting that we all have our, we all have our, our go-to phrases. Um, what, 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 what Luther would have smiled down at was the number of times this week and last, the justification was used. So we'll give them. We'll give them that. We'll throw that bone. You can't see me smiling, but I'm smiling. You've got my. You've got my profile. There you go. <laughs> when you see the veins in my neck stand up, I'm smiling. Yeah, interesting. Other thoughts? Let's just keep the ball rolling. So I was struck at the start um, that that these Christian these these Christians I wanted to say Christians it's like I'm singing a Christmas carol um, that these Christians walk into a world in which um, pagan belief permeates. It was a great word I picked up on that it was one of the first words mentioned. That, that 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 the Greco-Roman world um, worship of the of the of the um, emperor, depending on the era, and worship of the Greco-Roman gods permeated daily life. It was alluded to last week when there was discussion about um, how almost all the meat on the market um, had at one point been offered to the gods. Um, in the temples, which was the problem faced by Paul's community when they say, could we still eat it even if it was being offered? You know, all the meat that's out there, at least all the meat we can afford, has from the slaughterhouse gone to the temple, been offered to the, to the gods, and then it goes to the market. Um, so can we Christians eat that if it's been offered to the gods? And Paul's answer was, <laughs> sure, have it, enjoy it. Except if you've got new believers in your midst whose faith isn't as strong as yours if you've got a strong faith you can eat it and who cares you know it's food enjoy it and let it nourish your bodies um but if you've got young believers but people who are fresh to it they might be offended by this and so if it's going to cause them offense don't do it i mean that's paul at his most pragmatic that's pauline theology at his most pragmatic but it but it just shows you how uh, that uh, belief system in the greco-roman world permeated everything um and in come these christians and i'm sure you all figured out that the fire brigade is is what the brits call the fire department it may have been called brigade back in the days in in the u.s i don't know but uh you know you stuck out like a sore thumb if you weren't part of this system. And and yet, going back to where Steve started us off, and yet even in that inhospitable environment, Christianity thrived. Even in the face of persecution, Christianity thrived. Even in the face of being shot full of arrows, St. Sebastian, um, or having your head chopped off, well, there's too many to name, um, or being fed to the lions, Christianity survived. Uh, and now, where faith somewhat permeates the um, the culture, um, we don't thrive. 
Isn't that weird? It's almost, it's almost as if um, the church thrives the most um, when it sees itself as a resident alien. And, and I'm smiling when I say a resident alien because that's the title of a book by William Willimon, Bishop Willimon, William Willimon, a Methodist bishop, and uh, before he became bishop, uh, a chaplain at the chapel at Duke University in North Carolina? North Carolina. Um, and Stanley Harawas, um, who is a very provocative, now largely retired, but very provocative theologian. And they wrote a book called Resident Alien and made the point uh, very persuasively that Christians in the world are resident aliens. We're not citizens of the world. Um, that we that we live in the world um, as if it isn't entirely our home. Uh, that we are resident aliens in, in the world. And they make the point that when Christians live as resident aliens, they thrive. Um, and they are arguably more authentic in their faith. But when we're part of the culture and we feel really at home with everything around us, we don't do so well. And Philip Yancey, the evangelical author, uh, noted that. Um, and I can't remember if it was his words or he was quoting C.S. Lewis, eminently quotable, to say that, um, and this is, again, back to something that Steve brought up a minute ago. Um, Steve has now gone off to work. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, oh, the train left the station and went on another track there. You don't know if he was quoting C.S. Lewis. Yes. When he, when he said um, the church, oh, this goes back to what Steve was talking about a minute ago about grace. The church operates on grace. The world operates on power, which is ungrace. And whenever the church exchanges grace for power, the church loses itself and loses its soul. Because in doing so, the church has exchanged grace for ungrace. That was semi-profound. Um, any thoughts on that? No, not on me being semi-profound. Uh, but thoughts, thoughts on what's been said generally. You know, I wonder if the if the spread of Christianity in the early days was because of its simplicity. Uh, John three sixteen, uh, and your in your home, so to speak. You didn't have, you know, twenty gods and various uh, hurdles that you had to jump as many of the other religions. But if you would accept the Christian. Uh, religion, uh, it was maybe a little bit easier to deal with. That's a that's an excellent point, Doug. Because I'm, I'm uh, you know, they 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 did exchange non-jealous gods for a jealous god, which means that you really have to mind your p's and q's with our god. Whereas their gods only, as long as you, as long as you kind of did what their god said and well paid paid fealty to their god in a particular context you were good um but there's something about yeah I, I i could follow that line of thought doug you're you're saying there is one god who's lord over all and for people to be able to say okay i get that that's i get that let's go so i don't have to remember which god to pray to or offer sacrifice to for commerce or safe travels over the seas or fertility, uh, either personal or crops. Uh, and I don't have to, having to remember which God you owed fealty to for a particular thing. That's what I mean about the Greco-Roman gods not being jealous gods. You know, one Roman God didn't say, oh, you're off making a sacrifice to this other God. You shouldn't do that. You should make that sacrifice to me. They only got angry if you were making the sacrifice to that God for something you should have come to them for. Um, yeah, so you didn't have to keep straight which God you were meant to be asking for what benefit. Although, isn't it ironic that eventually the 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 uh, the system of saints in the Catholic Church ended up mirroring that precisely right. uh, for different reasons? Don't get me wrong. And and yes, Amy and I twice now 
have buried St. Joseph upside down in the garden, trying to sell our house, you know, when all else fails, buy a St. Joseph statue. Um, and as someone who's down to one set of car keys because I keep losing them, and in the old days that didn't matter, but now your car key is like a little computer. So now I've got a tracking device on this so that I don't lose this set. Um, but we ended up yeah, at St. Anthony. Oh, St. Anthony. St. Anthony. Anthony. Um, St. Jude is my saint, the painted saint of lost causes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but we, we, we ended up replicating it because we want to know who it is we go to for help in a particular, you know, who was the saint with the two candles, the, the saint, patron saint of throats. Um, but didn't that give Luther something to talk about? Oh, that gave Luther all. Oh, Luther made hay with that. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he most certainly did. His second favorite topic, uh, that, uh, the first one was having a go at the, the, the monks and the nuns. Um, uh, the, the famous quote from Luther, the monks and the fleas on God's fur coat. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so so exchanging grace for ungrace. Um, you know, Saint Blaise. Saint Blaise, thank you. Patron saint of throats? Yes. Yes. I used to know my patron saints better. Um, my, my Catholic wing of my family always had a Saint Christopher medal or a Saint Christopher medallion hanging from the, the rear view mirror. Until I think it was about 30 years ago, the Pope eventually said. You know, St. Christopher didn't actually exist. We should drop that. Uh, go figure. Uh, I loved, um, if I can just find the correct quote. I'm not finding precisely what I wanted. And you can't love the one you want, love the one you're with. So I'm just going to go with this one in front of me. Um, the idea that the church's mission is to produce signs of new creation. I love that. I'm going to rewatch that several times um, because I found that to be powerful that what the church does, we think we've got this mission and we can do our mission and we can do it by ourselves. And, and the scholars pointed out that nonsense is God's mission and God will direct us and empower us to do it. But that what we do is plant um, uh, signs of new creation here and there, that whatever we do, it's a little reflection of a sign, or it's a sign, so something that points to something greater than itself, related to itself, but greater than itself, and that everything we do is a sign or pointing towards that or reflecting the greater light of, um, of the new creation. Um, and, and I think sometimes we get too grandiose. Um, where we look at a project and say, well, that's that's pretty small. That's not going to change the world. And and if you take this, this model of theirs, it's like, well, I'm not out to change the world overnight all by myself. I just want in that family or that part of the city or that street or that neighborhood or that home or that whatever, that elementary school, I just want to plant a sign of, of the new creation. Um, let it reflect something that's greater than itself. Uh, now, th there's a way of doing church where, where often we say, well, if we're going to put $1,000 into this, how many hundred people are we going to you know, affect? And sometimes the answer is, well, not, not 10,000, but we, we, we might plant a sign of the new creation. That, that's good stuff. And then the lastly, it was connected to that, um, worship the creator God on the territory otherwise occupied by today's idols. That was a great quote. Um, and I guess that comes back to be, you have to have that resident alien mindset. Because if you're just in love with the world and think it's all working well, 
um, and that you know the your, your Scottish or your English or your U.S. culture is just hunky dory, and everything's largely going swimmingly. I mean, we'd like to change this and that, but yeah, you, know, um, you don't really think of yourselves as ministering, worshiping the Creator God while standing on the territory otherwise occupied by today's idols. I love that idea. And, and connect that. So there's three connections going here. And the third one is uh, when N.T. Wright talked about uh, Paul's concept of the, well, that unknown God that you're worshipping, that's really our God. Um, and he said, uh, place, uh, place the, uh, uh, there are places in this world where um, uh, the unknown God is found in many contexts or uh, you know, so that if someone is doing something that's wonderful, you don't have to dismiss it because they're not doing it for our God. You can take a, t a moment to say, you know, just as Paul said, that idol to the under, that that's to our God, that good work that someone's doing. Um, there's the potential that that's being done to the glory of our God. Let's just see where this goes. I think that they're doing it for one reason, but it's almost it benefits the poor, the oppressed, the, the widow, the orphan, and the distressed. Mm -hmm. it, it does come down to uh, for, the, for the glory and the benefit of, uh, of our God, of your God, you know? Yeah. So. Well, those, those are three points. I remember why we just leave with. So the church's mission is to produce signs of new creation. The acknowledgement that when other people are doing something good, uh, they may be doing it to the unknown God, which is our God. Let's just see how, how it goes. And then worshipping the creator God on territory otherwise occupied by today's idols. And it was kind of refreshing um, to hear N.T. Wright say that one of our idols is sex and that, um, you know, the antidote to that is to focus on developing strong, healthy marriages. Um, I can't quite remember the last time I heard that said in study materials. Uh, God, God bless Tom Wright for for holding that up. Um, you know, there was also war, and there was mammon and and eros and sexuality. And I think he did a splendid job of showing how those three things, not always, but can be our idols, and how the church can can offer a healthy alternative to to the, uh, to, to those uh, acts of idolatry. Okay, well, we brought it three twenty seven. Um, we have one more week after this, as I said. Um, I'll look forward to seeing you then. Uh, the last week's video was up on the website in a goodly time. Uh, this one will be also. Um, not that you would necessarily want to listen to my spiel again, but it's always good, I think, to have the opportunity to go back and watch the video again, the N.T. Wright and Michael Bird video again. So thank you all for coming, um, and God bless, and, and don't let the stifling humidity out there get to you. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye all. Take care. God bless.